Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening depending upon which part of the world you're joining us from. Welcome to the 48th webinar by the Water Channel which is also the fourth webinar that we are co-organizing with IHE Delft. Um, this is 2018 and we have spent I think the last 20 years hearing again and again from several quarters that the next big war will be fought on water. Uh, the premise of this idea is quite straightforward and it is quite convincing. Water is an essential commodity. Water is becoming increasingly scarce. Some of the largest freshwater sources in the world are shared by nations and provinces. So the scarcity will lead to conflict. Uh, however, in the last 20 years, we have also seen examples and cases which sort of disprove this premise. For example, Pakistan and India are two big nuclear armed nations who have had a stormy relationship to say the least. However, they share the waters of their transboundary rivers quite peacefully. Uh, sharing of the waters has not really been one of the bones of contention between the two nations who fight about just about everything else. Uh, if you have followed the works of the speakers of today's webinar, and I have, uh, you will be familiar with the idea that the probability of conflict depends upon so much more than scarcity. It is about geography, it is about hydrogeology, it is about change, and the capacity of institutions on the different sides to absorb the change. Uh, this is 2018. Nuance is not the flavor of the season, so I'm thankful to Aaron Wolf and Zaki Schuber for joining this webinar to add nuance and layers and substance and rigor to this particular discussion on water cooperation and diplomacy, which is usually, as I said, dominated by headlines, like the next big war will be fought around water. So Aaron Wolf, our first speaker, is a professor at the Oregon State University and visiting professor in water diplomacy at the IHE Delft. His research focuses on issues relating transboundary water resources to conflict and cooperation. He's a trained mediator and facilitator directs the program in water conflict management and transformation, through which he has offered workshops, facilitations, and mediation in shared river basins throughout the world. Zaki Schubert teaches uh, law and water diplomacy at IIT Delft. She's a lawyer by training, and so holds a very unique perspective on this topic. We look forward to hearing from her, especially perhaps what is international law, what incentives do sovereign nations have to abide by international law, and uh, how does diplomacy around shared international waters actually works? Uh, you would have already seen the detailed bios of the speakers on the homepage of the webinar from which you came here. So I will shortly hand over the proceedings to them. But uh, before that, some housekeeping. Uh, this is an interactive webinar. So we would like you to ask questions, share comments, and disagree with the speakers. Uh, you can do that through this chat window on the right hand of the screen, uh, which uh, you have seen, I think many of you. Uh, we also request you to type into the chat box as some of you have been doing, uh, your name, the name of your institution and your field of work. So we have a sense of who is the audience, who we are talking to. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the proceedings to the speakers, starting with uh, Zaki. Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Aaron. Thanks so much for that, that really kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I should note, I'm not just here for the day. I've, I've had the pleasure of being a, a guest here um, at IHG as a visiting scholar uh, for six months, which to my dismay seems to be coming to an end in about three weeks. So thanks uh, for hosting the Water Channel and also um, IHG Delft. So we start with the basic uh, premises of, of the problem, if you will. Uh, we have two images here of um, how people look at water. On the left is the way um, I think water people tend to see the world. They We see the world through watersheds. Uh, the only boundaries that we see are the boundaries of the watershed or the catchment area. Everything within this unit is connected, surface water, groundwater, quality and quantity. 
And on the right is the real world that everybody else sees, the boundaries that divide us, uh, the boundaries between sectors, between nations, uh, between uh, uh, states within countries. Uh, and the problem generally is that we need to manage water resources as if the world looked the way it, we see it on the left, recognizing the very legitimate reason for those boundaries on the right. And when we put those two together, in this kind introduction, we heard a couple of case studies that people have pointed to, the Jordan Basin that shared uh, between Israelis and Arabs, the Tigris and Euphrates uh, between Turkey and Syria and Iraq, the Aral Basin, uh, where tensions uh, between upstream uh, riparians who'd like to build dams and downstream riparians who need the water for agriculture, and of course the Nile Basin, where there are 11 countries that all share the uh, the watershed. And people have noticed that in, in places like this, where there's a certain amount of tension and water is shared, uh, and as we heard, there were a number of proclamations, especially at the end of the 1990s, the early 2000s, basically summarized by this quote by Kofi Annan, fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. And this is about the time that I first got involved. And as a scientist, I'm trained originally as a hydrogeologist. And the initial question that a scientist would ask when somebody proclaims the future, um, future warfare is, what do we know? What are the assumptions that, uh, uh, that lend us to such dramatic conclusions? And the kinds of things that we didn't know at the time were the most fundamental uh, sets of data. For example, we didn't know how many international basins there were. We had heard an awful lot about those uh, six. Uh, it turns out when we sat down to count them that there are actually 310 transboundary uh, watersheds. Uh, it's about half the land surface of the earth, a little less than half the world's population, and almost 80% of the, of the world's fresh water originates uh, within this basin. We also didn't think about an entire spectrum of things that countries might do. We had heard about the conflict potential in these six basins, but there's an entire spectrum that you see at the bottom of your screen of things that countries might do with each other. They may well co uh, conflict, as we had heard in the news, or they may cooperate or they may do nothing. So the larger question we had was a more holistic question. We had heard something, uh, anecdotal evidence from these six basins, what's happening in the rest of the world, and what's happening more holistically along a spectrum from conflict to cooperation. We have here in the same building uh, as IHU, we share with IGRAC, so we would be remiss if we all also didn't notice that there are some 600 shared aquifers around the world creating uh, probably the, the future areas uh, where tensions uh, may well arise. So one of the things that we tried to do uh, at Oregon and often in cooperation with our uh, collaborators here at IHE was simply to count things. We tried to count the world's watersheds. We uh, worked with uh, IGRAC on the uh, shared uh, groundwater. We compiled a number of treaties and laws and case studies trying to get this more holistic question uh, answered, what's happening in the world as a whole. One of the things that we did was go back and look over a 60-year period to identify every reported interaction between two countries and placed it along that spectrum from conflict to cooperation. We ended up with 1,800 events over 60 years, and simply by doing that, we got a little bit more nuanced uh, um, understanding of what the issues actually are. So here are those 1,800 events across a spectrum from cooperation to conflict. And what you notice right off the bat is that uh, the two-thirds of the time that we do anything over water, it's to uh, cooperate. That's all of this blue area here. Uh, if we look at the conflict side, almost 80% of conflict is this minus one and mi minus two. This is one of two things happening. This is either a politician saying we'll go to war over the lifeblood of, of the nation, or it's being reported uh, by a journalist that there's going to be conflict. And so in terms of actual violence, we're really looking at these few cases here, 38 cases over 60 years uh, that are reported uh, of violence, and it's small-scale violence. It does not escalate into a war in any of these cases. In fact, if we look at that minus seven, it turns out that there are zero wars, not now and not throughout history, uh, in terms of uh, a cross-border 
uh, warfare specifically over water resources. This relationship, about two-thirds of the time doing anything about water, tends to hold no matter what scale or no matter where we are in the world. So this is the state of Oregon, where I'm from, uh, the Western United States, uh, globally, uh, around the world, when we tend to interact over water, two-thirds of the time it's, it's cooperatively. The other question we were faced with is what does cause tension? Even if it doesn't cause violence, we understand fully that water causes tremendous tension. And if we're not managing water cooperatively, we're not managing water uh, efficiently. So we re really need to understand where the political tensions are going to be. And of course, the natural assumption is that Conflict is caused by scarcity. It, it feels intuitively right, but we also thought of what other stressors might be. Is it climate? Is it, is it population growth? Is it the level of development? And so we crafted again an, another um, uh, research project where we compiled all of this information, the possible indicators of water conflict, into a geographic information system. It was a hundred layers of data and it was 60 years long because the data changes every year. And once we put the data in place, the indicators should jump out and absolutely nothing jumps out. It, what, it turns out that we see uh, every indicator is um, statistical garbage. Basically, uh, statistically nothing indicates anything about anything uh, anywhere. So this uh, presents a problem until we start to look more closely at the data. Every single indicator did not indicate conflict, but there were pairs of indicators that did. So if we think about what happens in a basin, there are two sides. On the one hand, there's all the change that's going on in the basin. People wanting to build things, populations going up, uh, environment being degraded, economies going up. And on the other side is the institutional capacity that people develop in order to manage that level of change. And so when we have change in a basin, it's mitigated by the institutional capacity to absorb the change. And if you have strong institutions, you're able to deal with much more change. So scarcity by itself or dams by themselves don't cause conflict as long as we have robust institutions, good treaties, good relations, good history of working together that can mitigate. So what we find now is we, we, work, we have this working hypothesis, the likelihood of conflict rises as the rate of change within a basin exceeds the institutional capacity to absorb the change. The indicators we see, unilateral development, in other words, one country building something in the absence of an agreement about what to do about it. Uh, we have internationalized basins where the institutions were crafted under one government or an empire, the British Empire, the Soviet Union, and that institutional capacity breaks apart or general animosity. So now we can really identify uh, basins that may be at risk in the future. And we recognize now the relationship between uh, data that scientists uh, want and the, the political questions that people tend to ask. So in a, in, uh, if we look at most um, uh, basins, what the scientists will often ask is, how do I get more data? If only I could get a very detailed model, the politicians will suddenly do the right thing. This is the Southeast United States. There were two basins where, as in a lot of basins, there's upstream development and the downstream uh, states are concerned about the upstream development. And at some point in the negotiations, the negotiators recognized that water needed to be uh, preserved for the, for the delta regions, for the, for the coastal regions, for the fishing and the environment. And they turned to the scientists and they said, we understand that you need water. How much water do you need? And of course, for a scientist, that's a very scary question. Well, we need a 10-year baseline study and another 10 years to figure out the impacts of change. So you don't have that. Tell us your gut. Tell us what you, you feel having worked your entire life in this basin, and then we can adapt the management over time. So this now is, the, is what we're hoping to do is to, is to balance the desires of the scientists always for more data, for better models, and the needs of the politicians for very quick answers, even if it's uh, a best guess. 
Understanding this relationship, we now can map what we call basins at risk. This is the, our first map, 2003, and I would argue that many of these basins are not uh, are no longer at risk anymore. Uh, but we try and update this when we can, and we're working again between Oregon State and IHE and a number of other other. Uh, partners in order to get a very nuanced look at the dynamics in the basins of the world to try and help uh, um, to try and help understand where the basins at risk are going to be precisely so that we can uh, help build the institutional capacity needed to adapt to the change. So thank you very much, Aaron, for, for sharing with us these uh, these insights into what's been happening and, and what's happening now. And I think it's time to, to turn to uh, to two concepts, the, the idea of uh, water cooperation and, and water diplomacy. So as you've said, um, we see increasing competition over water for a variety of uh, reasons. Uh, there are many, and, and we don't necessarily want to, to look for one in particular, but we what we see is that uh, this competition is happening and it's happening at all levels. Uh, we make a distinction between water cooperation and water diplomacy. The ideas are the same, but we make a difference in terms of the levels at which uh, the competition is happening. Now, before I go more into that, I just wanted to say that we're starting to see uh, that a number of international institutions are noting issues around uh, water. We see that the World Econ Economic Forum um, in its uh, yearly report has identified water crises as a top global risk uh, for a number of years. Uh, the UN Security Council itself has also looked at the issue and the Security uh, the Secretary General has also uh, made some statements in relation to, uh, to water cooperation, uh, water resources management. And we're starting to read more and more in the uh, in the media about water conflicts, whether it's water wars, uh, strong words, in relation to the Nile, as uh, some of you may have seen on the BBC uh, news website, or competition at a more local level. Um, we see increasingly local communities uh, facing uh, increased competition, uh, different sectors, uh, different groups uh, that are uh, uh, competing more and more, and uh, this this is really um, starting to emerge from um, the water sector. What we've been talking about has been noticed uh, by uh, the professionals involved in the sector, but what we're seeing increasingly is that uh, a wider audience is becoming aware of these issues um, and is starting to um, get concerned about them. So. What, what really, uh, where, where do water cooperation and water diplomacy uh, come to be? So we identify first competition or a conflict, uh, perhaps uh, more than just competition, but disagreements, strong disagreements um, about water resources, whether it's access to them um, or uh, uh, availability of them uh, or other types of, uh, of conflicts uh, between different water uses. And there we can um, start to think about water cooperation and diplomacy as a means of achieving uh, conflict uh, prevention, conflict management, um, and uh, conflict transformation as well. So moving from a situation where we have a conflict to a situation uh, where we're dealing with the issue or preventing it, um, the idea being that ultimately we're trying to achieve a degree of water security for all users. So as I said earlier, uh, the issue of, of water and, and this increased competition, um, whether it's a real competition or perceived competition over interests, whether it's due to weak institutions dealing with water resources management or whatever it is, the water sector has been aware of them. Um, I have to say here that water disputes uh, are not a recent phenomenon. Um, historically, we're aware that uh, disputes um, date from uh, the time uh, from which uh, humankind has uh, been accessing water. But what's different is the fact that now it's really starting to affect much larger populations. Uh, a much broader audience is aware of these. And so we're starting to see uh, more involvement from different se sectors, uh, from, uh, from different uh, groups who are concerned about these. Um, 
and there are means and uh, mechanisms that are available to, to deal with these issues. So, so really, water coverage and water diplomacy is putting together the knowledge about water and using existing um, dispute settlement or dispute uh, prevention mechanisms. Um, and that's where we're, we're starting to see more interest in the concept, the idea of water cooperation and uh, water diplomacy. So what, what also makes a big difference nowadays is particularly in, in terms of diplomacy. So um, if we think of diplomacy in the, in the narrow sense, uh, we'll think of interstate relationships and interstate uh, interactions. Uh, whereas with regard to water cooperation, we think more of, uh, of the other levels that are generally within uh, a domestic jurisdiction. But when you think of, of water diplomacy and water cooperation, we realize also, we water people, that water is one issue amongst many others um, that uh, decision makers, policy makers, politicians have to deal with. So we come from, from the water sector. We see water as um, the most important, uh, the most important thing, um, and what everyone needs to to focus on, um, but that goes hand in hand with the other sectors that water relates to, whether it's agriculture, food production, energy production, uh, transport, um, and many other many other issues. Um, water, we realize, is one of these elements, and so what we're starting to see is. Uh, an understanding of the role of water within that bigger picture of state interactions and also within uh, the bigger picture of interactions between water users. Historically, there's been a tendency for fragmentation within the water sector itself. We see uh, water resources management developing in relation to irrigation, uh, developing in relation to energy production, developing also uh, in relation to navigation. Um, on fresh water, and for a long time, uh, these different sectors were able to uh, operate independently of each other, but there has come a point in time where this is no longer possible. Uh, water quality issues uh, affect uh, water quantity, water availability, uh, navigation and the pollution that navigation may cause has an impact um, on downstream users who then uh, are using the, the polluted water. So all of these different users are now coming um, together and uh, that competition is increasing. And those who were benefiting from these areas uh, are starting to see that they need to, to uh, understand better uh, water and water issues. So we have really now uh, a much bigger picture and we need to be able to place water within that picture. Now, what's interesting also, we, we've made a, a distinction between water cooperation and water diplomacy. As a, a lawyer, for me, that relates to the normative frameworks that operate at the international level and those that operate at the domestic level. Having said that, the distinction is an arbitrary one. Why do I say that? I think it's quite obvious that when um, infrastructure is built, um, in, a, in an upstream country, uh, for instance. The infrastructure will have both an impact on local population, there may be a, me a need um, to move local population, there may need, uh, be a, a, a need um, to uh, change the, the environment, and so there will be an impact locally. At the same time, it's very likely that there will be an impact downstream as well. Infrastructure like very large dams um, affect the flow of, of uh, water courses. And in that sense, if the water course is a transboundary one, downstream countries may be affected by the reduction of flow. So an issue um, that has both local impacts um, may also have um, impacts at the uh, international uh, level and vice versa. Decisions that are made internationally uh, between states may also uh, lead to events that have uh, immediate effects on, on local population. So the picture is one of uh, interconnections between all levels. So finally, uh, uh, a definition, we, we've been going around the, the theme itself, um, but really what we see is that water cooperation and water diplomacy are about the interactions between stakeholders and here all relevant stakeholders. 
Um, in relation to transboundary and shared waters, whether international or domestic, to enhance and entrench cooperation, as well as to resolve potential or actual conflicts um, around water. I think what we've seen is that um, there is significant cooperation. Also, Aaron mentioned earlier that there's more cooperation than conflict um, around uh, shared waters. Uh, but there's a need to continue to increase uh, that cooperation to, uh, to, to go back to uh, the law. Uh, we see that a, approximately 60% of all basins, transboundary international basins, don't have the benefit uh, of an agreement between the, the different riparians. And from the existing 40%, a number of them uh, don't address all the issues that basins are facing. So there's a need to continue to work on improving and uh, entrenching cooperation. So there are really um, a range of mechanisms that are available uh, to, to deal with uh, potential conflicts and actual conflicts with a view to uh, overcoming these conflicts and, and reaching more cooperation um, and water security. Very quickly, there are two types of mechanisms, diplomatic ones, legal ones. The diplomatic ones are the ones that are used more commonly, direct negotiations between riparians or, or users, um, assisted nego negotiations where an impartial third party comes in and helps uh, the riparians or water users uh, define and overcome, or discuss and overcome uh, the, uh, the issue at hand, and where uh, these means are not successful, very often there's a possibility of uh, turning to adjudication or arbitration um, and handing over the issue uh, for a resolution by an impartial third party, uh, either chosen by the parties uh, in the case of arbitration or um, imposed in the case of, uh, of adjudication. So a range of means um, available. The one that I haven't really uh, discussed in, in detail is uh, the normative frameworks and, and the legal arrangements that are already in place uh, internationally. We have two conventions at the international level, the 1997 Convention on the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses um, and the 1992 Convention on the Protection use and use of transboundary water courses and international lakes. These are universal instruments that apply to the signatories of these um, instruments. In the case of the 1997 convention, 36 countries. In the case of the other convention, 42 countries. Some of the provisions that they contain are considered to be of a customary nature, so applying to all states um, around the world. So there are incentives, legal incentives for states to, to cooperate and to share reasonably and equitably uh, the water resources um, that straddle their borders. Having said that, not all uh, riparian states have um, either entered into the conventions, these conventions, or uh, treaties at the level of, of the basin. So I think as, uh, as a lawyer, I see the va value in having uh, documents that crystallize and entrench the way in which states want to uh, to jointly uh, manage bodies, water bodies. Um, having said that, uh, getting states um, to agree uh, to, to these agreements uh, and conventions is where diplomatic means and water diplomacy has uh, a role to play. Aaron. Thanks. Exactly. Yep. So basically, we understand what, what water cooperation and diplomacy is. We understand uh, what it's not. It's not just about scarcity. It's not just about international. It's, uh, it's uh, at all scales and at all levels. And we understand that the skills that are brought to bear are not necessarily ones that most water professionals have. We need to think about process. We need to think about uh, institutions. We need to think about relationships. Uh, and in, in the courses that I offer, uh, certainly one of the central skills in water diplomacy is simply to listen, uh, to learn to listen to uh, the other side for a very particular reason. Uh, this structure that you see here uh, comes from uh, traditions around the world where they see that um, all of us at all scales have four basic sets of needs, our physical needs, emotional, 
uh, perceptual needs and, and spiritual needs. And what often happens in water resources, and those of, of you alums from IHE will recognize these tensions from, from uh, quite a lot of uh, cross-cultural uh, communication, in water as well. Oftentimes in water in the West, we focus on, on physical water, the amount of water, or the perceptual, the intellectual water. We think about how, how much it costs or where it should be allocated most efficiently, when actually the conflict is more either around emotional water, water as a, as a uh, manifestation of a difficult relationship between two countries, or spiritual water, which often in the West isn't raised in, in the discussion at all. And so recognizing that, that water dialogue needs to, to be able to address all of these different kinds of waters is one of the directions that we're hoping to take this idea of training in, in water cooperation and diplomacy. We look also at, at um, local methods for conflict resolution, for inspiration, for example, as a sulha from the Middle East, a ceremony of forgiveness, where we're balancing the, the needs of the individual with the needs of the group, and this wonderful concept, Ahdin, resolution of a conflict that involves no humiliation, is exactly the kind of approach that we're hoping to take. Uh, and a lot of uh, countries that um, have, have nominally moved beyond these types of approaches are rediscovering them and, and, and relearning how important it is for stakeholders to be heard at, at all different uh, scales. Uh, so in, in Singapore, for example, they're reliving this kampung spirit. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, community values can be brought into a discussion even as they start to live in, in apartment blocks uh, for vertical living. Um, this is the skills that we're trying to bring into our processes we're really trying to capture from, from all over the world and, and from many, many local and, and spiritual traditions, uh, including recognizing mythic stories, reframing, uh, using principles uh, to give comfort for progress, uh, and this idea of, of really thinking about what dialogue means, hearing for the shared values that we have. Uh, we, we don't have time to go into a lot of that here, uh, but I will, I will mention that finally, after some 12 years of thinking and, and writing and asking questions of communities around the world, uh, this is available now in, in a book. And it's written for precisely this audience. It's written for people who work in conflict at all different scales. It's a how-to with skills, with exercises, uh, and hopefully this may be of some use uh, to those of us who are, are working in the field. Uh, in conflict uh, resolution. And so very briefly, we want, wanted to share also with you um, what we're doing here in terms of, uh, of teaching and, and educational um, programs. Uh, what we've been saying is really a, a very uh, general overview, uh, and I'm sure many of you would be interested to, to know more. So we have a couple of uh, master programs, one of which we uh, run jointly with Oregon State University and the University for Peace. Um, there's a certificate for those of you who, who don't have the luxury of uh, spending time doing a, a master's program. We also have uh, short courses, uh, three-week courses, online courses, even shorter than that, um, and of course, tailor-made courses also um, for those who want something very specific. So finally, we have, uh, representing our uh, OSU IHE collaboration, we end with two quotes, one uh, Dutch quote from Baruch Spinoza. Peace is not an absence of war. It is a virtue, a state of mind, a disposition for benevolence, confidence, justice. And an American, Lauren Isley, if there is magic on this planet, it's contained in water. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Zaki and Aaron. Uh, we have uh, a few questions, and let's begin with them in a second. So uh, we have a question from Toli, Tolu Orekoya, uh, who asks, would you give us real life examples of where there is ongoing conflict and suggestions as to how they are being resolved or not? Yeah, would you like to take that? Well, I think I, I would say there are many conflicts, so um, I want to be very general here and to say um, there are ongoing conflicts and uh, some of them um, have been uh, resolved. 
examples of uh, ongoing conflicts. Um, at the moment, one of our students is doing research on conflicts between uh, pastoralists and farmers in the mouth uh, of a river uh, in, uh, in Africa and trying to understand what is really causing the, the conflict. It's expressed through access to water, uh, but he, uh, my student feels that the, there are more elements uh, that relate to, to the conflict, um, cultural uh, elements, historical elements, uh, socioeconomic uh, factors as well that, uh, that are at play. And at the moment, this particular conflict has been settled. Uh, the violence has ended. Uh, between the uh, the different groups. Um, having said that, the more structural or the root causes um, have not been uh, addressed yet. The institutional changes that would help uh, both parties uh, in, enhance their, their access to water and, and reduce uh, conflicts is, uh, is not yet uh, happening. I'd say internationally, uh, the ones that capture the headlines, um, the Nile, of course, uh, the Ethiopia is, is building a, a large dam, and there have been some stresses between uh, Ethiopia and downstream, especially Egypt. Uh, there's quite a lot of ongoing uh, dialogue over that. The Aral Basin is one. Again, upstream countries are, are building hydropower facilities, and downstream countries are very concerned. They rely on uh, um, timing of the water. Uh, for irrigation uh, during the, the irrigation season. Um, almost anywhere in Southeast Asia, uh, most of the major rivers in, in South and Southeast Asia originate in China. China, of course, has a growing energy demand, which often has a hydropower basis, sometimes concerning the downstream countries. In all of these places, we should mention, there's ongoing dialogue uh, precisely to, to address not only the specific issues, but the larger issues around upstream-downstream relations in a way that recognizes that uh, benefits really can be grown and shared if the water is managed cooperatively. And if I can quickly add also, um, to say that we don't have either conflict or cooperation, I think uh, remembering the, the work of uh, Dr. Nahomi Urumachi at King's College, uh, she's identified that you can have both co conflict and cooperation um, happening at the same time, uh, whether in relation to water uh, or other issues um, as well. And, and of course, it's a continuum, and, and you might have a conflict at some point in time that's settled, and then it might reappear later on. Uh, if, if you know, we're talking, for instance, about water availability, availability is not something that's stable; it changes over time, and so um, a situation that might, might be settled. Uh, at a particular point in time, may come back later on if, for uh, hydrological reasons, for instance, there's less water available. So the issue really nowadays is the ability to deal with these variations, uh, with this uh, instability in relation to, to water and, and beyond water, um, in order to continue to uh, ensure access to water. Yeah. This is a good time to put forward the question by Hala, who would like you to uh, elaborate upon uh, the water conflict in River Nile that BBC has broadcast recently and how the international law can play a role in solving this issue. So international water law has been um, developing for, for a number of years and, and the underlying um, assumption here is that uh, water is a resource that is shared um, by the world um, we have uh, water that doesn't recognize boundaries and, and will go from one country to another, cross borders uh, without realizing it. And having acknowledged that, um, the, the international community uh, through the 1997 convention and the, and the 1992 convention, also a universal instrument, um, has said that um, essentially all countries have uh, the right to use shared waters equitably and reasonably. So we have a very general uh, principle, but a very strong one at the same time, to guide states in their interactions uh, regarding shared water bodies. Um, there's a, a, a second principle, which is the principle of no significant harm. So states uh, cannot cause significant harm to other states through their activities around shared water bodies. Um, 
these principles, as I said, are broad. They need to be operationalized at the domestic level or at the level of uh, a basin or, or, or of the of the body in um, in question. So international law promotes cooperation. It encourages states um, to come together and to deal jointly uh, um, with these issues. The difficulty is that international law recognizes that states are sovereign, um, and in that sense, they uh, make decisions uh, on behalf of their own countries. And where there are no strong enforcement mechanisms or mechanism incentives for them to deal with uh, water issues um, comprehensively, then what we see is that states make arrangements uh, that are not necessarily in compliance with um, international law. So in the case of the Nile, there are a number of agreements and, and uh, the uh, current situation regarding the Eastern Nile is also dealt with in a tripartite agreement with uh, the three parties. I think the law is playing a strong role here, but we have to remember that implementation of law, whether domestic, uh, but particularly international, depends also on a number of other factors um, that the law uh, does not itself deal with. So political situations, um, economy um, are, are factors that support states um, in, in, in their dealings, and in some cases, um, states are not always in, in compliance with international water law, unfortunately. Uh, you have already partly answered this question or begun to, uh, but Brian C. asks, how can downstream stakeholders have a say in the control of a dam such as the GERD? Um, what legal body can ensure this? So, so there isn't a legal body, there isn't a, a, an international water police that goes around and, and forces states to, uh, to cooperate. Um, and I think that's, that's maybe one of the challenges of, of international water law. Um, there is this body of customary law um, of which the principle of equitable and reasonable utilization uh, is a, a cornerstone. But beyond that, it's really for states to, to acknowledge that they are bound by international law and to and to uh, behave um, in compliance with uh, with international law, and in the case of, of water law, it's uh, it seems to be harder um, to make states com comply with it. But what what the law says is that all riparians uh, need to to come together and discuss and agree jointly um, on. Uh, on, on activities that have an impact on the entire basin. So under international water law, uh, the, the, the operation um, of a dam or activities around a dam need to be discussed and uh, ag agreed and operated in such a way that international law is complied with. I'd say beyond the, the specific legal principles, there are a number of mechanisms that, that countries have turned to. The first thing one we ought to recognize is that people almost never uh, uh, go against agreements that they've signed, water agreements, that is. And so uh, dams that have gone in place, for example, there's a dam uh, that was uh, jointly constructed between the USSR and Turkey. And then when the USSR broke apart, it turned out the dam was now being managed between Armenia and Turkey. And these are two countries that uh, have had their share of tension. But that agreement continues to, till this day, that, that the two countries uh, continue to work uh, collaboratively. So other mechanisms that, that people have used, uh, occasionally the downstream country will put an observer, actually base an observer in the upstream country. Uh, that's happened on the Nile. A downstream country might uh, rent uh, or lease storage air space in the upstream uh, country's dam putting both sides, uh, creating a, 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 a shared incentives for both sides now to, to continue to, to agree to the, to the deal. Or reaching beyond water. Uh, in the Aral Basin, for example, the downstream countries are, are really concerned about the water. The upstream countries need uh, natural gas from the downstream countries. So as we, as we broaden the possibilities, 
make the, the pie bigger, if you will, we often can find agreements where it's in, in both the upstream and downstream countries' incentive to continue to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Sakib asks if uh, the cooperation around the Indus waters will continue uh, given the rapidly increasing population in both countries, I assume he's referring to India and Pakistan. I'll, I'll say quickly, uh, we have, neither of us, I think, have a crystal ball to say what will happen. We can only talk about what has happened. And I, I think it's, it's really useful in the Indus especially to distinguish between what the press writes about, what the, what the politicians talk about, and what the water people actually do in practice. So a number of times since the, the treaty was signed in 1960, uh, there have been tensions. In fact, two wars were fought between the two countries. Uh, and we should note again that in the middle of one of those wars, India made payments to Pakistan as part of their treaty obligations. So a number of times there have been stresses, and when there are political stresses between the two countries, the politicians and the journalists often have played up the possibility of walking away from the treaty, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, changing the agreement or, or ignoring the agreement, and each and every time that there have been actual water uh, contention, um, they've gone back to the treaty and followed the conflict resolution mechanisms to the letter. There are three levels of, of conflict resolution in the agreement. And so each time they've gone back and, and figured out how to use the, the mechanisms in the treaty to resolve. And they've only reached the, the third level, the most intense level, uh, binding arbitration once uh, and, and are now uh, trying to figure out how to follow that. So we think in a number of transboundary basins, there will continue to be greater tensions, uh, which only which only uh, require us to think more intently about agreements. How do we how do we create more robust agreements uh, that that allow changes to be adapted to as they happen in in the world? We're not hearing you uh, any longer. Uh, Lily Ann from Cologne asks, since water cooperation is not only at international or interboundary level, what do you think of the concept of water stewardship as a remedy for local conflicts between big users like industries and domestic users? So I think there's there's definitely a, a need to uh, to acknowledge the issues and and to deal with them. Um, the, the challenge may be uh, to find uh, the will to do it, but perhaps through, through water stewardship uh, there can be a mobilization of, uh, of local actors um, who, are, who are concerned and, and, and want to see uh, changes. I think the, the, what's really important is to be able to understand what's going on in a particular situation, in a particular conflict, and to be able to identify uh, the correct uh, points of entry or, or, or good points of entry um, to discuss, to, to engage uh, with other stakeholders with a view to uh, solving uh, a conflict. I think there needs to be a, a number of, of uh, things in place, both the, the, the will to, to do that, the ability to identify these points of entry, and then um, to be able to engage with, uh, with um, the big users or, or, or all the users who, who are uh, impacted and, and affected. And identifying also the processes that will be relevant, uh, you know, in, in a negotiation, there's more control over the process, over the outcome. The parties will have greater ownership. But we also acknowledge that in negotiations, there may be some asymmetry uh, in power between the different stakeholders around the table. Um, and there needs to, if that's the case, uh, one must consider other remedies, also other ways of, of trying to, uh, to tackle the issue. Uh, whether it's bringing in uh, a third party or going to court, um, the, this is also important. So I think it's a, it's a, a number of issues um, together or a number of factors that need to come together in order for that to happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. I want to add, it's a, it's a great question. I'd love to hear the, the um, context from which it came. I think this idea of using either stewardship or sustainability is, is what we call performance criteria. So when we get a group together, we ask, how will we know we've, we've been successful? Uh, what will we use to measure our success? And, and this is, the, these are two that you hear from time to time to help keep a process exactly to, to come to the types of conclusions that, that uh, Zaki is talking about. If you use either stewardship or sustainability as performance criteria, so there was a, a basin in the western U.S. Um, that was working around a, a set of issues, and this is ranchers and, and farmers and environmentalists and tribes and city people. And then there was a big uh, multinational bottling company that wanted to come in and, and use some of the, the local springs for, for spring water. And there was a process, and it was really interesting how it happened, because they, they did decide early on in the process that sustainability would be the, the criteria for success. And the question that people kept asking in the middle of the process was, if you get what you want individually, what will the impact be on the basin as a whole? And as a, as a result of that, that precise kind of conversation, uh, it was determined by most of the, the, the participants uh, that the bottling company really didn't belong in, in this particular basin. And uh, it was by no means a unanimous uh, uh, agreement, but they collectively agreed that their shared vision of a future did not include uh, this big um, bottling plant in the middle of their basin. Mm -hmm. um, two related questions. Um, which have to do with conflicting regimes uh, or conflicting water laws. Brian asks if uh, you could say something on the Malawi-Tanzania border dispute where colonial treaties and international laws clash uh, on the, at the border between the two countries. And Aza asks many of the international treaties along the Nile were signed during the colonial era and now some countries recognize them and some don't. How can we define the correct treaties to rule the water relations? Uh, those are two good questions and, and uh, difficult questions, I'll say. And I, I was just told that we have five minutes left. And I don't think I'll be able to, to deal with both questions in, in five minutes, um, unfortunately. I have to say also that I'm not familiar with the Malawi-Tanzania border dispute and, and the treaties that are, are there and uh, the issue of, of border. And I don't know if it's a, it's a border in the water or if it's a, a land border. Uh, border issues have been the, the subject of, uh, of many disputes. The International Court of Justice has been asked uh, repeatedly to uh, adjudicate on, on these matters. Um, so in this particular case, I, I, I'm not in a position to, to really advise, not knowing more about the, uh, the, the context. Um, what I would say is that you know, treaties reflect the, the intentions of states at a certain point in time, but treaties are not made of stone. It's always possible to uh, renegotiate the terms of a, a treaty. The, the, the issue there, of course, is, is that word renegotiate and bringing um, the parties together around the table um, to discuss the content of a treaty and, and change it um, is, of course, the, the, the key issue. So there's always the possibility of doing that. And if that's not uh, uh, possible, then parties very often choose to, to go to court. Um, regarding the, the Nile, what we see is that Often there are a number of treaties that relate to a basin. In some cases, it's only the water. In other cases, uh, you have environmental treaties that also relate to, to particular basins. You have uh, treaties of, of a different uh, nature that have provis provisions that relate to, to the basin. And so um, there is the issue of, of legal pluralism um, that applies in the case of the Nile and in the case of other uh, basins as well. And I think. You know there there are different ways to to look at it. One of them is to say you know let's uh, start from scratch and let's craft and design a new agreement um, that will deal with the the issues uh, without contradicting um, other other provisions, other norms in place, other frameworks in place. And so again, this idea of negotiating and and 
coming together uh, where the key issue is, is having the political will to, to do that. Um, the other way is to um, uh, and now I've forgotten what the other way <laughs> that I wanted to explain is. Uh, the, I mean, the other way is, is um, again, to, to try and, and I think it's, it's looking at the mechanisms that we have available to, to, uh, for the states to agree. And there, if, if there's no agreement um, as to how the situa situation needs to be dealt with from a, a legal perspective, um, I think I would say um, adjudication uh, would be the best way to, to resolve it, if adjudication is open, because of course that's also dependent on the consent of the states. So looking at the time, I guess we can only go for a couple of short questions. Uh, one is uh, Abhishek asks if uh, there have been any agreements on uh, transboundary aquifers that you know of. Okay. Yeah. So it, so very quickly, there are over or approximately 600 transboundary aquifers. There are a handful of agreements. Uh, the most famous one has to do with the Geneva aquifer between France and uh, Switzerland. Uh, but there's more recently the DC uh, aquifer between Saudi Arabia and Jordan, and there are some aquifers in uh, northern Africa that also have um, agreements uh, relating to joint management of these aquifers. So very, very few agreements in place for now. Um, Raj asks, uh, how, how do you see the role of the private sector and businesses in water conflict mediation or transformation? I think um, if we really want to talk about a representative uh, stakeholder group or, or people who really represent the watersheds, oftentimes private sector key key uh, stakeholders uh, in a lot of in a lot of places. And I, I think, like any stakeholder, we want to separate out what's useful to a process, which other other aspects which may be irrelevant. One of the best examples that I know of um, in, in the western U.S. in the state of California, a number of years ago, all of a sudden, uh, the, the CEO of Bank of America, at the time the largest bank in the world, looked up and realized that everything they were invested in relied on a safe, safe stable supply of water re resources. He said it didn't matter if it was real estate or, or industry or, or agriculture, everything everything relied on water. And they hadn't thought about water uh, much at all within their uh, corporate portfolio. And so once they recognized that, they did come in quite, um, quite helpfully, in fact, in a lot of the ver very difficult uh, water politics in California. Uh, to help with resources, to help with process, to help with legal expertise. I think this is the kind of uh, example often that um, uh, private sector can bring. They're oftentimes very efficient, very organized. They have networks. Uh, if you take Coca-Cola's distribution network throughout the world, for example, if you could harness that to bring some kind of uh, uh, water quality technology uh, th this is the kind of partnership we look for. Of course, oftentimes people in different sectors have different incentives and different motives, and so it's useful to consider that as well. We're not hearing you. Perhaps we have time to squeeze in one last question. Uh, the conflict around water is based on the emotional relationship with water, something that was discussed. A key point. How can we incorporate that into or consider that um, in our scientific research? <laughs> well, let me just say it's not either or. I think it's hand in hand. We need the science to understand what's happening in the basin, and it's not enough. We need to understand the emotional, and spiritual, and physical needs of, of the people in the basin, and it's not enough. This is the point, I think, of hydro diplomacy, of, of water diplomacy. It's bringing the water and the diplomacy together precisely in the same in the same network. And I would say one of the most one of the most powerful ways of, of addressing, I think, the emotional relationship we have with our water are in water festivals. It seems to me that oftentimes scientists, the the the, the strategy of, of science is to is to really scare people about the future, the 
trends are, are bad and getting worse. And people oftentimes just want to celebrate the relationship with water. So if you look at, at festivals that people have celebrating the art, celebrating the relationship, celebrating the, the, the higher aspirations and, and relationship that we have with water, and you, you sneak in some scientific, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word? Um, bring the scientists out to help talk a little bit about the science as well, that's when we're bringing kind of heart and mind together into the same conversation. Yes, and maybe just to end, I, I want to say we all recognize the, the value of water. I think, you know, there isn't a book about water that doesn't start by saying water is life. Um, and we say it, but when we look at our interactions um, around water and when we think about the conflicts um, that we're seeing, uh, sometimes feels like we forget um, how emotional water is. And I think, as you were saying, Aaron, we, we need to, to make sure that those emotions are there when we're looking at these uh, issues. And for all of us, and decision makers, users, uh, private sector, um, diplomats, um, to, to bring that element into our considerations around water. Thank you so much. Thanks, Zaki. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks especially to the audience for joining us, uh, for joining the discussions. The discussion extended in several directions and so it would be difficult to summarize. But uh, for me, the big takeaway is uh, that cooperation around shared waters is not just dependent on goodwill of individual parties. There's a wide range of incentives to work towards cooperation, which range from the practical to the emotional and the spiritual and a whole lot of categories in between. Um, we are happy that the webinar was able to start a discussion, which I'm sure we will continue to take place, um, which will continue to take place on several platforms uh, in the time to come. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you again and say goodbye with the announcement that a recording of this webinar will be available on uh, several websites, the UNESCO IIT website and the one that I just typed into the chat uh, box and uh, announcements related to future webinars will also be found there. The next webinar is in May, I understand. Uh, further details will be announced shortly. Uh, thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.